Hey, everyone. It looks like people are still joining, but I'm going to go ahead and, and intro us in today. Thank you so much for uh, logging in today on beautiful November 2nd. Uh, it looks to be a, a very sunny Southern California day here. Um, my name is Tony Watson. I'm here on behalf of Robert Holland Associates sharing the digital podium uh, with Scott, with Marshall Reddick. Uh, and it's always good to share the digital podium with like-minded individuals. Scott and I were just catching up. We're both, uh, we both went to the same alma mater, Chapman University down in Orange County, and we were, uh, we're, we're adventuring into the new chapter of life. I have two children myself, a boy and a girl, and Scott has as a child as well, and they're going to be uh, introducing a, a new little one in, in January. So we were, we were catching up before getting started here today. But uh, I'm just going to take a couple quick minutes to go over a topic that is really near and dear to my heart as a tax professional, and that is uh, basically the power of protecting your wealth and assets uh, through year-end planning, and especially during uh, times of economic uncertainty. I'm going to take about five or 10 minutes here just to run through a couple things. A little bit about myself. I've been with uh, the Robert Hull and Associates tax firm uh, based in Glendale, California for almost two decades. Uh, my individual client roster, uh, just my client roster, not the firms, but just mine. Uh, my clients range anywhere in the 500 million plus range in managed real estate and other business dealings. I am also the keynote speaker for Robert Hull and Associates. We speak at over 140 plus events every year. I by no means am a one-man operation. I work alongside a wonderful senior consulting staff. We're about 55 employees strong here at Robert Hall & Associates. Uh, we've been open since 1971, so we're by no means a, uh, a pop-up shop uh, that has started over the past couple of years. We've been around for over 50 years. Uh, we've got great reviews online, so if you're looking to um, or seeking uh, tax advice for yourself, for your loved ones, if your coworkers or family members, friends are looking for new tax advisors, uh, we do offer free consultations, which I'll leave my contact information in the chat box um, through, throughout the webinar so you can access that. Uh, and then also we're kind of a one-stop shop for all of your financial needs. We do tax preparation. We offer incorporating services. We do internal auditing, bookkeeping, you name it. We service it from a financial perspective. This is what Bob Hall dreamed of 50 plus years ago. He wanted all of these services under one roof. And so we only have one location in Glendale, California, but we do service tax filings in all 50 states. Uh, and we do actually have clients in all 50 states. We service roughly about 12,000 tax returns per year. So uh, once again, we have a pretty, pretty broad range or reach across the U.S. Uh, before I bring Scott back on, I just wanted to mention uh, for real estate investors, a couple of really important key topics on the tax side of things uh, coming out of the pandemic. One of the most popular elections nowadays is cost segregation. Uh, cost segregation is mainly for real estate investors. If you have residential rental properties or commercial investment properties, and you're looking to exercise elections that might help accelerate deductions to help reduce taxable income on your cash flowing investments, cost segregation might be the option for you. What cost segre segregation is, is it's the ability to reach forward into future years and accelerate your building's depreciation write-offs to take it mostly in this year to help increase expenses, reduce overall tax uh, taxable profit, retain all of that earning or all of that profit that you had for this year, not overpay with Uncle Sam in the state of California, whatever state you're filing in. And then with all of that tax savings, hopefully you plug it back into buying more real estate. So if you're interested in learning more about how cost segregation might apply to your situation, uh, once again, we do offer free consultations and I'll give you that information in a couple seconds here. Uh, last but not least, that the, at the 23rd hour, the federal government in passing the Inflation Reduction Act, they decided not to correct or change any part of Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code. The 1031 exchange is kind of the holy grail of tax shelters. It gives you, the investor, the real estate investor, the ability to take a, your, your, your high-valued real estate portfolio. Let's say you own uh, a property in Orange County or here in Los Angeles County that you bought 20 or 30 years ago for I don't know, $150,000, $200,000. Now it's worth $2.5 million. And you want to diversify your real estate investments from one door into maybe 15 or 20 doors across the US. 
the federal code allows you to take that two and a half billion dollar property and instead instead of paying the capital gain tax on it package that up into an exchange and trade it for other properties uh there are a couple rules that you want to follow obviously if the home that you have here in california has debt attached to it when you exchange into your new investment or investments you have to carry the same amount of debt uh, if you access any cash out of the exchange it's considered to be boot uh, B-O-O-T, like the boot that you put on your shoe. And that boot, when you access cash out of the exchange, because you're not deferring the whole taxable amount, uh, that boot becomes taxable to you. So there are some uh, really unique okay. games that your tax advisors can play on your tax returns to help you maybe access funds out of the exchange to pay off student loan debt, to pay off primary mortgage interest debt, to pay off credit card debt, limiting the amount of tax exposure, and then taking the remaining gain and exchanging it for other like-kind investments elsewhere in the US. We've seen a lot of that over the during the pandemic years. We continue to see it where people are exiting California and really able to buy multiple doors elsewhere in the US with their high value California real estate assets. Um, so once again, I just wanted to mention we do offer free consultations here at Robert Holland Associates. I will type our contact information into the chat box. Uh, so if anything that I touched on briefly today, if you have more questions about that, please feel free to reach out to Robert Holland Associates and set up that uh, free initial consultation. Okay. Uh, Scott, that that was it for me. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. We're going to we're going to toss it back over to you. Um, and thank you so much again. You know, great, great catching up with you. Hopefully when I'm down in Orange County, we'll we'll meet up and grab lunch or a drink sometime. Okay. I need more, I need more advice from, uh, you know, somebody who's got the two kids now and has been there for a few years. And as, as Tony said, uh, about a month and a half away from our second, um, we have a boy. We're about to welcome a girl. Tony and I were just saying how in just about every way possible, he and I are brothers from another dimension, I guess you could say. Um, it's funny because I'm going to say so many of the same things that actually just you could just insert real estate instead of taxation. Um, Tony and I have had the you know privilege of knowing each other now for say about what is it maybe 14, 15 years or so. We connected um, a couple of years after graduating, and uh, you know same friend circle. We went through the same uh, not only the same alma mater, the same um, school of, of business, and now have. Um, both, uh, you know, it's funny building our businesses, building our careers, building our families. It's 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 uh, it's just crazy how many similarities there are between uh, the two of us. So, with that said, Tony and I have also done, um, I would say probably to the tune of maybe 100 to 200 online or in-person seminars together. Um, it was meant to be that Marshall Reddick found Robert Hall, or that Robert Hall found Marshall Reddick was absolutely meant to be. Um, as I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, as Robert Hall is a one-stop shop for all things taxation, Marshall Reddick is a one-stop shop for all things residential real estate. Um, our, our company has also been around since the 70s. We're also a private company. I've had the, you know, the privilege of meeting Bob Hall Sr. Marshall Reddick, who retired 10 years ago, has met Bob Hall. So it's, it's a great relationship. We're very thankful. Um, Tony, again, I'm always thankful for the opportunity to speak um, you know, to your, to your sphere of influence and, and to your clientele, many of which um, we probably have met. Um, if, if any of you folks joining us today have ever been to um, Robert Hall's office in Glendale, um, you know, we've, we've done many, you know, in-person seminars. I might even have the opportunity to meet some of you in the past. So, you know, thank you guys, you know, so much for joining us. I'm sitting here uh, in beautiful Newport Beach, California. Uh, this is our we call it our, our office headquarters. Uh, we're right by John Wayne Airport on MacArthur. So if any of you folks are near Orange County, south, north, or even in LA, we, we love meeting face-to-face. Uh, -face. We do tons of Zoom calls as well. So I uh, hope we have the opportunity to meet. And, um, you know, thank you guys all for joining. Um, Tony, I was, I don't know if you saw me, but I was like, I was just really getting excited and, and you know, putting my thumbs up for, you know, the 1031 exchange to not be impacted um, that is a catalyst of wealth for so many of our landlords, um, especially some of you that might own property in California, uh, which is where, you know, Tony and I are sitting right now. Um, that has been a catalyst for so many of our investors to utilize and tap into, you know, the wealth creation that we see from, you know, the California real estate market, not necessarily bringing in the income based on the, you know, the wealth of the property and the, and the value. We might not be able to see lots of positive cash flow, but, we do 1031 exchanges constantly. Um, there's, I don't think there's ever a period of time that we're not facilitating 
anywhere from, you know, a few to, you know, a couple dozen exchanges at once. Um, we work with the same uh, 1031 intermediary that Tony and, and Robert Hall suggest, which is Asset Preservation Incorporated. Um, and we've facilitated hundreds and hundreds of exchanges uh, for our clients over the years. So, you know, that was definitely one that I was watching very closely because that really is a catalyst for wealth. Um, and, um, you know, so we're, we're going to start from the beginning here today. We're going to talk about how to buy investment property. So I'm going to be going through um, some of the building blocks of investing in real estate. So I'll be talking about uh, how to set your investment criteria, which kind of comes first. So where do we start on this search and, and exploring either our uh, local environment or maybe just all over the United States, which is something our company opens up um, many territories across the U.S. that are really ideal for real estate investors for a lot of number of reasons. I'm going to show you all of the office locations that we have. Um, like, like Tony said, I, I'm also on a very large team. We have about 125 staff members at Marshall Reddick spread across four different states uh, from California, Texas, Tennessee to Florida all pretty unique and, and uh, uh, you know, di diverse real estate markets. And I'm going to show you not only just, uh, you know, where we're located, but some example properties. Um, but first, you know, let me, let me get into, um, you know, who Marshall Reddick is, what we do, um, what we offer. So uh, just like Robert Hall, we're a one-stop shop for all things residential real estate. So we are a multi-state real estate brokerage. So that means that we help both primary residents and investors purchase or dispose of, um, of real estate. Where, where our niche is, is really in the one to four unit uh, residential up to small apartments. Um, we sell and manage anything maybe from like 15 units all the way down to single family homes. So um, we do the management. And that really, I think, is a big part of that one-stop shop approach is that we're only suggesting locations and properties that we're going to have to be the ones to um, – to create that and, and, and you know, turn that dream into reality, um, the rubber meets the road with property management. So we're only suggesting properties and neighborhoods and locations where you know, we're actually going to be the ones um, touring the properties, writing the offers, and then after the property closes escrow, actually doing those renovations, leasing the property, you know, making it a turnkey asset, and then managing the tenant on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, I'll go over the markets that we're located. Um, I would say that about 70, 75% of all of our transactions are non-owner occupied, um, but we also do work with people buying and selling their home in California, pretty much all over Southern California. Um, so we do, you know, we do a lot of like end-to-end -end transactions where uh, most companies wouldn't be able to facilitate like a listing on a property in LA or Orange County or even Inland Empire. We can be the listing agent on that property facilitate the whole exchange, um, you know, put together a portfolio of options of properties that make sense for the investor, run those analyses, you know, have those conversations from a very advisory standpoint. And then when it comes time for fulfillment, we connect our clients, you know, to the lenders, to the realtors, to the property managers that we have in each of our territories. But we have brick and mortar offices. We have eight brick and mortar offices between California, Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. So we're not all over the US. We're in, we're in very select strategic markets. Um, we, we really specialize, like I said, in that like multi-unit up to small apartment um, kind of domain. We're very particular about the specific neighborhoods, the zip codes, the communities, um, because we have property all over the market. And I'm gonna share some uh, aerial map photos of like where our properties are located in certain areas to kind of you know, illustrate that point. Um, we also do private money lending. So that may be something that interests or suits you as a borrower. That might be something that interests or suits you as a lender. Uh, we are a licensed NMLS mortgage lender. We originate first trustees and mortgages, both uh, long-term and short-term financing. So some of our loans go to small builders or um, rehabbers, fix and flippers. A lot of the loans go to most of our investors that do buy and hold um, we only do financing in-house for non-owner occupied. Um, we also refer some really good conventional lenders that Tony and um, the team are pretty familiar with. Um, so we've got a lot of great contacts. You know, we're fortunate to have such an amazing team with our preferred uh, tax and accounting firm, Robert Hall, 
Um, we've got um, great relationships with insurance agents, self-directed retirement account administrators, um, 1031 accommodators, lenders. So we like to bring this, this kind of team approach to all of our clients, just give them the best service possible. Um, volume wise, you know, it, it ranges last year, we did about 650 transactions across all the markets that we're located in. And as I said, about 70, 75% of those were investment properties. So that's definitely our niche. And we provide a lot of education, um, that I'm going to go into a little bit here tonight. Um, I won't have too much time to get into our investment fund, but we do have a private real estate fund that we use the debt fund. Investors can invest in the fund and receive uh, both a preferred return and a profit split um, amounting to about eight and a half percent between about eight and nine percent annually and it pays quarterly distribution so it's a great passive investment and um, it's twenty five thousand dollar minimum there is an accreditation requirement if you're looking for something that is still backed by real estate because the, the, the funds get lent out to our um, borrowers that are either doing the long term uh, financing and we're receiving those origination fees and the interest that that goes towards the profits of the fund. Um, so any of these, you know, services you can find out more about on our website. I'm going to jump into my background. So you saw 18 years of experience at, at Robert Hall. Now you're seeing 18 years of experience at Marshall Reddick. So I'm not joking when I said that Tony and I have a lot of similarities here. <laughs> um, I, uh, at my, my day job, I, I call it my day job because I'm both an employee and employer. I'm fortunate enough to also be a partner of Marshall Reddit. But uh, my, my day job, which is very much an active full-time role, is VP of Property Management and Real Estate. We've got about 45 uh, staff members in property management, about 50 in real estate. I certainly don't correspond with all of them regularly. We've got great sales managers, property managers, regional property managers, um, that I'm, you know, corresponding a lot, you know, with from a pretty high level, uh, always looking to just be the best and improve and, um, you know, to grow our portfolio. We currently have 2,700 units under management between all those territories. So, you know, it's a private company. Um, our portfolios range from about 300 units in California to 1,500 units in Texas. Of course, we've got a lot more support and staff members out there. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I'm kind of all over the company in a lot of different ways. Um, as I mentioned, graduated from Chapman University with Tony um, in um, Orange, California. And I, I had the, you know, very just, I guess you could say, just uh, um, a, a very amazing opportunity to join this company in my early 20s. And, um, you know, it took me a few years to really let everything sink in, but I was able to buy my first investment property in 2009 um, that was out of state pretty far away in uh, the state of Alabama, <laughs> which I'm not from and didn't know anybody other than some realtors and property managers. Uh, I've also since then purchased another property in Phoenix, Arizona. I own property in, in Tennessee, Texas, and then a, my most recent uh, purchase is my primary in California. Uh, so I'm really interacting mostly with our realtors and property management um, leaders in the organization. And, uh, you know, just, I've just met thousands and thousands of investors of all shapes and sizes. And, um, you know, I think we have a recipe that works. Um, we, we really stick to kind of like, you know, the, the grassroots model. Um, we, we don't like to try anything that we're just throwing against the wall. We go off of statistics, data, you know, experience. Um, and we like to help people um, succeed and really just avoid um, all of the potential risks and, you um, you know, uh, limiting their exposure as much as possible um, when they're investing in real estate. So we are um, advisors first, and uh, this is one of our real estate advisors, Cameron, who I wanted to make sure you guys have his contact information. Cameron Scott, is available. Scott, to your, your, your screen isn't being shared. I, did, I don't know if you, you, you know that. You're, I don't think anybody can see your screen right now. Are you? Are oh, you no, no, I'm not sure why. So it's, uh, it says share on my end. Do you want to try, are you still sharing or do you want to try to stop sharing on your end? I, I am not sharing on my end. So, um, and it does, and it does show that you have the ability to share, but, but yours wasn't sharing. Like I can't see your screen on my end. I don't know okay. if anybody else can. Oh, my, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Your screen is sharing. That's my bad. My bad. It, it is. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, nope, that's all good. I appreciate it. Thanks for looking out. Um, okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so what we really are first are real estate advisors. What is a real estate advisor? 
Well, um, Cameron is an example of a real estate advisor. We have about 10 advisors at Marshall Reddit. Uh, they're consultants. And um, Cameron, like all of our advisors, is licensed um, as experienced with not just the local market, but all the markets we're located in. Um, he's connected to all of our service you know, staff members in property management, lending, real estate. Um, he's located here in Orange County. And his job really is to just have a nice conversation, exploratory conversation, no matter really where you're at, even if you're far away or you think you might be far away from being able to um, you know, take action in real estate, uh, we're here to have these conversations and point you guys in the right direction. So you'll find that um, you know, it's, a, it's a very much like a um, consultation with being as long or as short as you want. We might do many, many face-to-face -face or phone calls with you, no matter where you're located. Um, we work with investors, not just all over the country, but all over the world. Um, in our portfolio, we have landlords um, that live in about 20 to 25 different countries across you, across the world. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're just very familiar with the territories and the strategies. Um, and so Cameron's a great point of contact that you guys can, can connect with. Um, real estate investor, mortgage fund investor, also a graduate from um, uh, a uh, business school here in Orange County at Vanguard. So that's going to be my, my takeaway after tonight is to offer you guys to have a phone call with Cameron um, at your time and just really kind of pick in his brain. And um, that's, that's what we offer. We like to provide free education and mentoring. Uh, we are a service-based company, uh, not fee-based. So we make money when people buy or sell real estate, use our property management, um, borrow you know, money with us. But we're here to talk to you know, all of you guys and, and um, help guide you in the right direction. So my main topics today are I'm going to start with uh, how to set your investment criteria. It's a very personal thing. Your criteria might be very different from your coworkers or friends or neighbors. This has a lot to do with your experience, your financial goals. Um, your capabilities, you know, what options you have to invest in real estate. So I'm going to go through that first. I'll be talking about how to do due diligence. So how do we research from a high level the, the metropolitan markets, then going down into, well, how do we research the neighborhoods and the communities, and then getting even more micro in how do we analyze the property, the actual property itself, uh, and what should we be looking for? So um, next I'll be going through property management. Property management is a huge part of long-term buy and hold uh, real estate investing. I think it's the make or break factor. I call it the X factor. I think you can have an amazing property, but without good property management, you just have a bunch of commodities sitting there and it's not um, providing you that financial benefit that you're looking for. So it's really all about the property management. Uh, most investors will own their properties for maybe 10 to 15 years on average. How do we ensure the continued performance of that property? all in the property management. So I'll be going over uh, more how we do property management, not necessarily just like what we charge, but I'm going to go through, you know, how we lease, um, how we manage, how we hold tenants accountable. So I'll go through that a little bit more. What locations uh, Marsh Riddick has brick and mortar offices in. So I'll show you the exact territories we're located. I'll explain why we're in San Antonio, Texas, why we're in Cape Coral, Florida, why we're in Nashville, Tennessee, um, those are just a few of our markets, um, and I'll be sharing all those with you tonight. And then I'll be able to go through three property examples. I have three different examples, um, some single family, some multifamily. They're in all different locations, Florida, Tennessee, Texas. So I'll share those with you and uh, kind of show you the financial performance and how we, how we analyze properties, um, you know, based on the numbers and the calculations. And I'll be touching just a little bit about financing. I know that's a, that's a huge part of tapping into today's real estate market. Um, I will be showing you basically just how we tilt the odds in our favor to get rates a lot lower than what we might be seeing the par rate for. How are we negotiating really aggressive um, concessions or price drops or um, rate buy downs from builders and sellers to get rates at you know, maybe 6% compared to 8%, um, but really how we're getting um, just good deals right now. I wanna share some of that with you guys tonight. So where we'll begin as an investor is going over our um, investment criteria. So I just like to share the uh, the you know investment methodology here, which Marshall Reddick adopts, which goes clockwise from why all the way to who. 
Um, we want to start by figuring out why are we investing in real estate. So this is exactly what Cameron and our advisors go through with each individual to help them really define why they're investing, meaning like what financial um, return, what are the financial outcomes we're looking for, um, what is what is that financial goal that we want out of you know this investment in our entire portfolio if we're looking at growing it, how how you're going to be investing. So we open up different options. Some investors might utilize a 401k. Some investors might use conventional financing. Some might use private financing. So we just put all the cards on the table and explore each of those options with each individual. Um, and I'll go through some of those options. When it would make sense for you as a, as a person to invest, not necessarily timing the market because that doesn't always work out, but when would it make more sense for you based on just like where you're at in your journey um, then we're going to, you know, we go through what, so looking at, um, you know, what types of properties make sense for you. Maybe it's a starter, you know, single family, three bed, two bath. Maybe you're at a point where you want to expand and you're looking at multi-units and apartments. For some folks, you might favor new construction. Some folks might favor resale properties. So, uh, we just kind of go through the pros and cons of each, each one, each property type and the different criteria. We open up all these markets that we're in because it's kind of like a, I use a silly um, analogy of Baskin Robbins, but you know, all of our markets have all these different flavors based on the appetite of the investor. Um, I'm sitting here in our California office. We also have an office in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is just a complete total opposite. Um, very low price market homes in the 200 to $300,000 range, different economy, you know, different financial benefits. So, all these different territories have different, you know, uh, benefits based on your appetite as an investor. And then finally, we have the team, um, and we'll be talking about, um, you know, the, some of the individuals that that we bring in from the lending to the insurance to um, the 1031 exchange to just make this all possible um, and really just increase your return, decrease um, the headache and the risk. So let me get into the investment criteria. So. Many of you, and I would say at this point, probably all of you have shopped homes on Zillow or Realtor or Redfin, and we've all looked at probably a lot of different properties, and we're sometimes captivated by the, uh, the pictures or the price or um, the description of a property, but when we're in the world of investing in real estate, the main criteria that, um, that's going to matter the most to us is property class. We have that there on the left, because we can look at a property and filter that property based on the price range, bed, bath, square footage, uh, lot size, year build, condition. Is it in a homeowner's community? Is it not in an HOA? Um, you know, it, what, what, you know what, uh, what kind of surrounding area is this in? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different um, criteria that we can analyze on a property. All of it, literally all of it, from the number of beds to the square footage to the age of a property to the um, even in some cases one or two story lot size, all of it will impact the financial return. So we start by going, let's create this model property and let's talk about what type of property makes sense for you and why. And then we start bringing in all these options in all of our different markets. So what type of property makes sense for you? Let's start by talking about property class. That's not a very common um, that's not a very common metric that most investors are aware of, and it's actually the most important one. So I have this uh, this scale here, this property rating scale. Um, this comes from a book that we authored about eight years ago after looking in our property management portfolio um, and and analyzing hundreds of properties in our portfolio in all these different markets, Texas, Tennessee, California. Um, Florida, all these different markets, we, we have um, our software at Folio, which allows us to see the maintenance and vacancy of every property that we manage, and we manage all different types of property. Um, and we also, in addition to that, receive hundreds of applications a month on our rental properties. So um, we started analyzing the demographic of renters, not necessarily like based on the state or the city, more based on the property class. What we started realizing is a very common trend here. So if you look at the bottom of that scale, every major metropolitan market has um, a median home price. And the median home price, based on uh, when compared to the subject property, 
is going to dictate property class. So I'll show you the calculation in a moment, but our pro the property class of the homes we live in and all the properties that we might own and the properties that we'll acquire in the future, all of them have a property class. It's going to range from luxury down to D class. Again, it's going to be based on the ratio of the median home price in that metropolitan market compared to the subject property that we're buying or selling or just analyzing. So first of all, let's talk about what type of property class makes sense for us. So it's very similar to the financial advisory world. Are we looking for income? Are we looking for um, capital appreciation? Are we looking for a combination of both? Keeping in mind that none of us are gonna be able to retire off of one property. Um, most of us aren't gonna have to go out and just you know, accumulate a massive portfolio in order to retire financially independent, it might just be a few properties and it might be, you know, a five or 10 year um, journey of acquiring properties and doing, a, you know, an exchange here and there. And then one day looking at a portfolio of, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 units and, and seeing a, a significant amount of um, uh, principal reduction in the loan and some appreciation in value and rent increases. So um, it's a snowball effect. So if you haven't you know, already heard that already, um, you're not going to see um, nearly the, the amount of juice squeezed out of that property for many years, right? So where do we want to start? Is our, is our journey going to take us more the income rate route or the capital appreciation route? Um, what's our experience, right? Is this our very first acquisition of an investment property? If it is, we might want to reduce our risk as much as possible. Higher property classes carry less risk. So I'm going to, you know, again, we'll, this is what we do as advisors to help each person figure out what property class. And that property class is going to tell you what type of tenant, quality for, you know, credit, income, criminal background. It's going to tell you whether the property is going to see more um, profit from cash flow or appreciation. It's going to also tell you how much potential maintenance and vacancy you're going to have. And that's really a key factor. It's easy for us to analyze the property's performance if we know the you know, mortgage amount and the insurance and the property taxes and whether there's an HOA and if we're paying a property manager. But this is how you're going to be able to calculate how much potential maintenance and vacancy a property is going to have. So higher property classes, higher prices, lower property classes, lower prices. With that comes higher tenant quality in higher property classes, lower tenant quality in lower property classes. And let's just talk about that for a minute. So Right off the bat, as an investor, you want to avoid the extremes. You don't want to be in the luxury class range and you don't want to be in the D class range. So as an investor, you're really wanting to stick to either A, B, or C. Now, if you live in a home, and let's say it's a home that you bought five or 10 years ago, and if you've seen lots of appreciation in that home and you move out of that home and rent it as a you know, rental property, that might be considered a luxury class property. Um, really, if we're going to be acquiring a property, the only time that it might make sense to buy a luxury property is if it's going to be our primary residence. But going out right now and buying a property so far above the median home price would require such a significant down payment that, um, you know, we're just going to see no return at all off the income. And um, it's not necessarily going to make sense on paper. Now, D class is going to be for all the other reasons. These are areas that have higher crime rates, lower school districts. Um, very difficult to qualify tenants based off of income and credit and criminal background. Um, now, what types of neighborhoods are these, right? So looking at A-class properties, we're probably going to see a much higher chance that that property is in a homeowner's association. So there's already, you know, there's rules and regulations. There's CCNRs that, um, that are in place and forced to um, keep the, the quality of the, the community, right? As a property manager, we're only responsible for the property. We can't control the community. So you'll, you will see a lot more HOAs and, and uh, A-class properties. Uh, I don't think you'll see any um, homeowners associations in properties that would be considered like C or D-class. Um, the other thing is that in A-class properties, that's going to be in a neighborhood that's going to have a much higher percentage of owner-occupied properties, so more pride of ownership. C-class properties. We're going to see those properties in neighborhoods and areas that have a much higher percentage of rental occupied properties. So um, because of these factors, we see more um, appreciation and value in A class. And uh, with that, on the opposite end of the spectrum, on C class, 
we might be able to buy a property where the price to rent ratio is much closer, offering um, a better opportunity for cash flow, but that may not be a property that's going to see much appreciation over time. So um, neither is better or worse. I just want to comment that. It's just which one is better or worse for you. But again, we do avoid luxury and the class. So um, you all have the opportunity, if you haven't already read it, to download our Reddick Property Rating ebook. I'm going to share the URL in a moment. Um, that's going to be one of my biggest takeaways here is to download our ebook that has uh, just pages and pages of links um, to a lot of really, really prominent um, sources, one of which is the National Association of Realtors. So <clears throat> I don't know the, I think this is page 15 maybe in the ebook. Um, when you're looking at the digital copy, you can click that map. It takes you to the NAR website which has been tracking the median home prices in every single major metropolitan market in the country for about the last 30 years. That is key data. We need that data in order to determine the property class. So we have that data. It's, uh, it's on our website. It's in the ebook. We, we want to make sure everybody has that data so they understand the median home price in whatever market they're looking at buying or selling property in because we need it to be able to figure out the property class of our subject properties. So the top scale is for single family residences. The bottom one is for multi-units um, or apartments. Um, the percentages are percentages of that metropolitan's uh, current median home price. So easy examples, let's take uh, like uh, Nashville, Tennessee, for example. Um, you know, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but let's just say the median home price in Nashville is uh, 400000 it, it might be a little more, but I'm just kind of, you know, for easy numbers here. Um, if the property, if the median home price in Nashville, the market we're looking at is currently four hundred, and we're looking at another single unit property, uh, condo, townhome, or, or single family, let's say that property um, is, is worth 425000 then we know it's going to be on the, um, I guess you could say that, that lower end of the A-class property range. If we're looking at a property in Nashville and it's a uh, $200,000 property, we now know that it's on the border of a C and D-class property. Um, we have to adjust multi-units because the data is based on detached single-family homes. Um, so a, a detached property of the same size square footage typically going to be worth more than an attached unit of that same size um, and square footage, so we have that adjustment here. I'm going to show you the maintenance and vacancy that you can um, that you can use and that you can expect over a long-term average in each property class. But here's why maintenance and vacancy is different with different property classes. Here's why some properties um, in property classes appreciate and some don't. So I mentioned kind of like the dynamic of those neighborhoods a little bit. But, um, and this is very general, we, we looked at thousands of applications to come up with this data. Keep in mind, like if you own a property for 10 or 15 years, you might have a handful of different renters in there over that period of time. So this is gonna be like the law of averages. Um, in luxury class properties, you have everything from business owners, um, high income executives, you also have maybe inheritance. And, and so you kind of get a mix of people that, that have enough wealth to afford a rental property in a much higher range. Um, here in Orange County, we, we look at luxury class properties that are probably around like maybe ten to $12,000 a month and up. That would be like the low, current local, um, I'm talking about Orange County, which is obviously a pretty high priced market, um, where in some cases, um, in some of our markets, a property that rents for $2,500 might be considered a luxury class property. So um, what types of renters do we get? So with A class, uh, which is really like where we want to stick with that A, B, C category. Um, these are, we're, we're going to see more job stability. Um, we tend to see more job stability. We set, tend to see tenants that might have multiple sources of income, so maybe dual income earners. Um, we also see tenants that have a higher uh, probability of owning property at some point in the past. They might have a little bit of experience with, um, you know, taking care of a property, and, um, you know, replacing water heaters and putting hair catchers and shower drains and replacing air filters and uh, maybe unfreezing uh, garbage disposals, you know. So we, we tend to see a higher percentage of renters that may have owned a property in the past and more job stability. 
um, and uh, usually maybe a, a professional in, in their field. B class are median income earners in that particular location. So we'll see a range of everything, young adults, um, even retirees in some cases, um, who are right around the median income earning in that particular market. Um, C class is normally going to be like hourly wage. We, 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 we call it more percentage of maybe blue collar employees, not as much job stability um, and, and no, no probability in most cases that they've owned property in the past. Um, so that's just a little bit about, you know, the demographics there. D is uh, if you're familiar in California with Section 8 housing, government assistance, usually people who are uh, below the poverty line. Now, let's talk about um, some elements that impact property class and some that don't. So as we go down the infographic, what are factors that influence property class? Really, a lot of it just has to do with the location based off of the crime rate, based off of the school district ratings, based off of the demand for people wanting to buy homes in that particular area. When there's more demand for people buying, prices go up. Um, obviously, not as much demand in the um, purchase arena, then we're not going, to, we'll see more stagnation, you know, in, um, in property values. What doesn't matter very much are some of the aesthetics, the age of a property, the size of a property, the condition of a property, whether it's uh, attached, detached, that does not impact property class nearly as much as location. So when everybody says the three magic words in real estate are location, 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 that was true 50 years ago, and it's still true today, and it's going to be true for the rest of our lives. That's what really impacts property class. So you can think of each property class um, with the acronym down at the bottom. A class is going to see more appreciation. B class will have a blend of both. C class will have more cash flow. And um, as it always comes down to, you know, dollars and cents for investors, this is why we're talking about property class. We want to be uh, aware of how much potential maintenance and vacancy we're going to have uh, based off of whether it's A, B, or C. So these are percentages that we use in our estimates. Um, we use these in our financial performance. Um, when we're calculating the return of a property, we put these estimates in there. These are percentages of the monthly rent. Of course, it's not going to be 100% accurate, but what you will see over the time and over the years, it will start to average out closer to these percentages. Of course, if we buy a property that's already rented and it's a three-year-old home, we might not see much maintenance and vacancy for quite a while. As that property turns 10 years old and 15 years old and 20 years old, we'll start to see more of that maintenance and vacancy, uh, more maintenance kick in, um, and we'll start to have some vacancy when tenants move in and out. So um, these are just good estimates to use. Um, we'll show some financial performance there. The top one is for one to four units. Uh, the bottom one, which is for apartments, you're going to see more maintenance. Apartments have <clears throat> laundry rooms and, you know, um, um, some have uh, amenities and maybe maybe pools or vending machines. So there's just there's more there. There's more maintenance, you know, in an apartment building than in a, you know, um, smaller residential property. So when we use these percentages for vacancy of either 8, 10 or 13 percent of the rent, we can multiply that by the number of days in a year. That tells us how many days we're just factoring in for vacancy each year to look at that bottom line. Um, I don't care how hot the rental market is in any market. When someone moves out of your property and you have to do a move out inspection, or at least we as property managers do a move out inspection, we coordinate um, estimates and bids from our preferred vendors. We go over those estimates with our landlords. Then the, then the contractors and the handyman do the work. We take professional photos. We list it online. We do our own showings in-house. We do the showings. We get an application, approve the application, and then they might move in in ideally a week or two weeks from now. No matter how hot the market is, when you have a renter move out, it's going to be, you know, at least a 30-day process to get a new renter to move back in. And we certainly don't want to cut any corners and get trouble for it, you know, and get in trouble for that later. So, um, you know, it's, um, there's a process there, and we, we, we go through that process to make sure that we make the proper deductions from the previous tenant security deposit and that we remedy any, any issues or deficiencies before the next tenant moves in and that we cast the property in the best light possible by taking professional photos once any of that work is completed. Um, we're very aggressive when it comes to 
our leasing agents who work, you know, morning till, till, till late at night to respond to potential interest and do showings on nights and weekends. Um, so we're aggressively marketing our properties um, to try to fill them within under 30 days on the market. But there is that process there, um, a tenant turnover process before we can list it for rent. So these are percentages that, um, that make sense. Uh, ideally, you know, we, we stick to properties that attract families. So what does that mean? We're selling three to four bedroom homes. Most of the properties that we sell are three to four beds, two to three baths, two car attached, you know, garage, detached single family home because we want long-term renters. And, uh, you know, we found that families are the best category of long-term renter. So um, our property rating ebook can be downloaded for free on marshareddick.com forward slash ebook. Um, I encourage every single one of you to read it if you haven't already. It's only about 38 pages doesn't take more than maybe an hour. It's chock full of data. We have updated this ebook zero times in the last eight years because everything in there is timeless. So um, I hope you guys get the chance to download it and read it. Tons of good um, resources in there. Um, and uh, hope you guys all you know, learn a lot from that book. So where does it make sense to invest? I think right off the bat, we can all agree that not every property in every city in every state make sense as an investment so that gets our mind thinking into okay well then like what states and what cities and what neighborhoods do and what states and what cities and what neighborhoods don't so um you know we, we follow a lot of the the key economic trends right off the bat the job market we want to see the lowest potential unemployment rate but we also want to see um the you know most amount of job growth in many different industries so low unemployment, um, high job growth, economic diversity, that all brings in, you know, more population growth, more people that can rent our property, because we want to open up the tenant pool as much as possible. When we go to dispose of property and exchange it, we also want to open up the majority of buyer pool. So the properties that we're, that we're sticking to, they're very close to the median home price. And they're not two-bedroom homes, and they're not five-bedroom homes, and they're not 3,000 square foot properties, and they're not too small of properties. So, you know, we're very specific. And you can look at dozens of properties on our website. I think you're going to find our model is, like I said, three to four bed, two to three bath, two car, detached, single family home. And, um, you know, the least amount of risk possible. So we don't sell investment properties that have pools, no playgrounds, you know, just a you know, I joke around and say you're boring home, right? And uh, those boring homes open up the majority, <laughs> those, you know, standard type homes where really the square footage is on average about 1,200 to maybe, maybe 2,000 or 2,200. Why? Why do we want to stick to that? Once again, when we listed for rent, we're opening up the majority of the rental market. We'll have the most amount of interest, lowest days on market, most applications. And um, we look for markets that have housing affordability. So these locations we're in, at least outside of California, are all below the national median home price. So we're seeing um, median home prices in our markets from about 250 to maybe 350,000. That's really between Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. If you look at you know, all the homes we sell, I said we sell about 650 properties last year, almost all of them are going to be between about maybe 250 to like 400, 450,000. Um, that's that's really just like right below or right above the median in most of the markets we're located in. These uh, areas like Austin and Nashville and San Antonio all have lots of colleges and universities that bring in students who you know enter the workforce after college, um, and then we provide the property management in-house which really is that, that, that key factor to make this all possible. So these are the locations in green that we have brick and mortar offices. I was actually just up in um, the Bay Area last week. I spent the week up there um, with our preferred lender, Reed Hazard. Um, we were in San Jose, um, Fremont, uh, San Mateo. Uh, we have a small team up there and we do manage a very small portfolio of properties. Most investors that are in the Bay Area are looking outside of the Bay Area as the market um, to invest in. 
um, not only because of the price points, but also just because of the, the rental laws. Um, outside of California, our territories in Tennessee, Texas, and Florida are extremely landlord friendly. Um, we do not have rent control in any of the, um, the areas that's um, starting to kind of unfold a little bit in Austin, but we don't have rent control in San Antonio, Houston, New Braunfels, um, Clarksville, Fort Myers. Um, so we have a lot more, um, I guess you could say a lot less red tape um, for landlords in those areas. Um, we can send a notice of non-renewal to a tenant at the end of their lease term. Uh, we don't have caps on rent increases. So, um, you know, and, and we're just, why are we in Nashville? Why are we in Houston? Why are we in uh, San Antonio? These are all major metropolitan markets that offer, you know, a lot of economic diversity. They offer housing affordability. They're all very strong markets to invest in. And we have to think, like, the market that we're, that we're investing in, it, it can't just be strong now. It's got to be strong in 5, 10, 15 years from now. So it's not just looking at, like, the current trends. I mean, we've been in these locations um, for over a decade in most cases. So, you know, we're constantly looking at the trends. And, um, you know, they prove to be um, year over year just very strong investment markets. And you can look on Forbes and Yahoo and CNN, and I think you're going to find most of these locations in that, that top list of investment markets. And it, it's a blend, right? So the one-stop shop approach with Marshall Reddick allows investors, and we have hundreds and, and, and you know, thousands of them, that own property in multiple locations. So somebody might start in um, Florida or they might start in Tennessee or Texas and go, you know, after that closing, everything you guys said, it worked out. My property rented. I'm, I'm happy with the experience. And now I might want to look at a different territory because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket and we do want to be diversified. Marshall Reddick offers that ability because we are in all these different territories. So um, again, that one-stop shop. So um you know, I have uh, I know a lot of the staff at Robert Hall, and I, I, I met a lot of them and been to that office so many times. And um, we've got, um, you know, a lot of the staff members you're seeing on our screen out here. Many of them have also, you know, flown out here to, uh, to California. Um, you might have um, met some of these or seen some of our um, staff members speak on webinars. So these are just a handful of our locations. On the top right is our Newport Beach office on MacArthur Boulevard. That's our, you know, administrative office. We've got our marketing team, accounting team, software team. Um, so we've got a lot of our, like, back-end support. You're also seeing our private lending team, uh, some of our realtors, leasing agents, property managers. Now, out of state to the, to the left here, on the top left, that's our San Antonio, Texas office. Down there at the bottom left is our Clarksville, Tennessee office. Um, in the middle at the bottom is our uh, Cape Coral, Florida office. And there on the bottom right is our um, New Braunfels, Texas office. So it's about maybe 75% of the staff members that work at Marshall Reddick out of state, they're all in either our property management or real estate departments. So maintenance managers, tenant coordinators, leasing agents, property managers, um, realtors that, that work with our clients. So um, if you are ever looking to visit one of our markets, you certainly can. Um, we make it possible to not have to through all the uh, phone and video communication and email communication that we, uh, that we do here. But um, I always like to show the incredible people, hardworking people. Uh, many of them are also real estate investors. We've got about 25 staff members that own rental properties in our different markets. Um, a lot of them are lending money through our private lending, and we, you know, we try to get our staff to um, take advantage of these opportunities, and we incentivize them to do so. Because obviously we, we want to not only, you know, benefit our clients, but we want to benefit our staff members as well, too. So um, I always like to show my team. Um, they're the ones that make it all possible. So just a, a couple aerial maps here. The one on the left is uh, San Antonio. On the right is Austin. These little colored markers are properties that we manage. These could be single families. Uh, many of them are multifamily. Um, we're able to just upload our list of addresses into Google Maps and get these, uh, get these nice aerial images here. So um, at the very top, you can see our strategy here is to actually target the suburbs of major metropolitan markets. Um, so we're, we're really following the trend of um, school districts, good school districts, low crime rates, and really like where's the rental demand and where's the demand for long-term um, families that, you know, they want to turn that rental property into their home 
and ideally stay there for a long time. Um, so what, what I wanted to illustrate here is that um, uh, we are heavily concentrated in some areas and we're not concentrated whatsoever in others. And, um, you know, you can kind of see, at least in San Antonio, the majority of those properties are on the north side above the 10 freeway that goes right through San Antonio. And these are a lot of the suburbs. So um, these pockets of properties we're in are um, Alamo Ranch on the far left, going clockwise, Helotus, um, Alamo Heights. Um, we're in um, Converse, University City, um, Selma, Shirts. These are all suburbs of San Antonio that we tend to see a lot of rental demand and, um, you know, just uh, basically ability to command good quality renters um, and uh, just less, less issues in general. So in Austin there, we're mostly on the north end of Austin and the south end, not too much like in the, in the inner city of Austin, but a lot of our properties are on the north, like Round Rock, Pflugerville, Georgetown, Leander, Cedar Park. Um, south end, we've got a lot of properties in Kyle, Buda. Um, so we're, we're directing people and saying, look, we would recommend these properties in these locations based on what you're looking for. Um, and we're very familiar with the market and we're, we're familiar with the areas that we also wouldn't recommend for different reasons. So, um, so you're getting that real boots on the ground um, experience and service when working with Marshall Reddick. Um, our, our property management fees are on our website. You know, property management is not a huge profit center at Marshall Reddick. It's, it's not designed to be. Um, we look at property management as just like a break-even center of the business. Um, we want to basically provide the best service at a competitive rate. Ultimately, we want to be able to control the um, financial return of that investor. And, um, you know, we, we put our money where our mouth is, and, and we're the ones that have to rent it, manage it, um, after we sell the asset. That's also basically one of my biggest takeaways here is that whoever you work with in investment real estate, you should work with a company that leases and manages the asset that they sell you. They lose all accountability whatsoever. If you're working with, let's just say a realtor, um, any realtor, <clears throat> that's not going to be the one to actually rent or manage that property because realtors aren't set up to do professional property management. I also wouldn't recommend buying a property from one company and then using a property manager in a different company, um, you, you, you lose, um, and there's a lot of disconnect there. So you'll really see, I think, the best experience working with that company that, you know, long after escrow closes, they still have to, you know, meet all those expectations and, and um, uh, projections that they set before you bought the property. So um, we have a, you know, a huge portfolio of properties and um, huge staff members to provide, you know, lots of staff to provide the best service possible on our portfolio. Um, so, you know, our, our property management fees range from 8% down to 5% based on the number of units in a building. Um, what I'll just say is that, you know, we can talk about property management for hours, but I just want to share that, um, you know, this is property management created by landlords for landlords. And, um, you know, we, we, we know that uh, landlords only buy more property when they're happy with property management. It's our goal to provide the best service for competitive rates. We're not going to be the cheapest in the industry. We're definitely not going to be the most expensive. We try to provide the best value for, for a very competitive price. So um, a lot of things that we do here, and I know we're getting at um, six, uh, eight, or nine, depending on what, what time zone you're in here, but... Um, you know, I got about maybe maybe just a five or ten more minutes. If uh, you guys stay with me here, I want to just talk about um, you know some of the things on basically how we do property management. So uh, we do all the tenant communication. That that's something we keep that owner um, away from having to communicate or correspond with their renter. We're a full service property management company. We do everything from the you know renovations, the leasing, the management. Um, we you know we do evictions when we have to process evictions. Um, we, 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 uh, you know, we do a lot of like, um, remedying certain situations. We get a lot of properties that are actually transferred to our management. Uh, that map you saw about maybe 80% of those properties, we were the agent and we brokered that transaction about 20% were transferred to us. So we're pretty picky. I would say about the properties that we take on, um, we want to make sure that they fit our, you know, portfolio, they fit the niche and, and the type of property that we're 
you know, that we focus on. Um, so we don't manage just any property out there. Um, we certainly don't sell any property uh, out there either. But um, yeah, it's full service property management. So um, we're doing, you know, unit turns on tenants that move out. We're doing rent increases on renewal cycles. We're coordinating the repairs and maintenance. Tenants are logging onto their portal and app folio and submitting rent payments and submitting maintenance requests. They can expect to hear from one of our tenant coordinators within under 24 hours. Uh, we, we troubleshoot whatever the issue is. We may end up sending out one of our handymen or contractors to take a look at the issue. Um, we do not perform any work under $400 without owner approval, meaning we will get estimates. If we're doing large work like paint, flooring, appliances, we're going to get multiple estimates. A um, couple quick questions here. Um, I, I want to be able to get to a few of these. 15% of rent on each annual renewal is correct. And they know what? Let me explain that for a second. That's a good question. Why do we charge a lease renewal fee? We charge it because we do annual inspections. I didn't get a chance to get into that. When a tenant wants to renew their lease for another term, and it has to be a minimum of 12 months, we perform a walkthrough inspection, which usually takes us it's maybe you know 30 minutes to an hour to perform. We're taking pictures and we're really looking at, are there any lease violations and are there any building code violations? We look to see if the, if the lease says no pets. So when we go there, are there no pets? Um, we look at um, the, um, you know, are they replacing the air filters? Um, are they, um, you know, are they basically like, um, you know, living up to all of the terms in the lease agreement um, that we ask them to? If not, then they need to, you know, correct that um, before, and we need to make sure that it's been corrected before we go back to that property, um, or excuse me, before we, we sign the extension. The other thing is that we do a rental market analysis report, send it to the investor to justify our rent increase, um, negotiate through that process. Um, so just a little bit about, that's a good question, why do we have that, that lease renewal fee? Um, so we conduct, uh, kind of getting down here, um, our tenants, pay on the portal. The portal auto charges a late fee if they're late. We call all of our renters the day that rent is considered late to let them and remind them that the rent is late. Um, if we don't have the rent plus the late fee, usually by the 8th to the 10th of the month, then we're posting a three-day notice. Thankfully, we have to do that in a very, very rare cases. We have an extremely low default rate um, you know, within our company. Um, our eviction rate is below 2%. Our default rate is below 8%. Um, and in some cases, a lot of those are properties that we took on under management and didn't sell. So um, one of the benefits is that we have a lot of terms in our lease agreements that hold the tenant accountable. We're charging them early termination fees, insufficient fund fees, uh, late fees, notice posting fees. So um, we're very aggressive with that. We charge the highest late fees that each state allows. Essentially, look, they're renting from a business. They're renting from Marshall Reddick. They're not renting from a mom and pop landlord. They're renting from a company that has hundreds of reviews on Yelp, Google, Zillow. Um, they know that we are a large company. We're going to do things by the book. I think that that's a precedence that gets set immediately uh, as soon as the tenant even looks at a property that, that we have. And we do inspections at least once a year. We do inspections at move in, at renewal, at move out. So we're very big on conducting um, inspections at least once a year. I just want to say, because I only have a short amount of time left, um, that on the top right there, uh, we have removed any conflicts of interest in maintenance that a lot of other property managers have, because a lot of property managers do repairs and maintenance in-house, meaning it's a profit center. They make money when you lose money. Our structure is that we only make money when the landlord makes money, and we don't make money when the landlord loses money. We don't charge any fees during vacancy. We don't have any markups on maintenance and repairs. So basically, it's a, it's a pass through, you know, it's our job to coordinate maintenance. Um, it is not a profit center of our company. Because of that, I believe that that is the biggest reason why we have a very successful um, property management division, um, because that's, that's not um, something that is common in many other property management companies. Online reviews, you can look us up on Yelp, Google, Zillow. Um, and read lots of reviews. Um, I believe at this point we have somewhere between like 1,500 and 2,000 reviews. Um, you know, I don't want to keep you guys too long, so I kind of want to get through. Um, Reed is a conventional lender. He's with CMG Mortgage. 
He's licensed in all the markets we're in. He's also an investor himself. Um, he is able to get very competitive um, uh, rates right now, but really where we're really getting rates down as low as possible is by negotiating rate buy down with builders and sellers in a lot of our markets. And we're very successful at doing that. We also fund a lot of property through our private lending, which does not have a restriction on how high the rate buy down can be. Conventional lenders can only allow up to 2% of sale price for a rate buy down. In private lending, we've had loans that we funded that have had 6% um, uh, sale price rate buy down. Um, and so, you know, we, we like to offer both conventional as well as our in-house private financing. I apologize is that I don't have time to go through um, some of these details here. I just want to show you guys a couple of the investment properties in the market that, um, that we're located in. So what we're looking at is San Antonio, Texas. This data comes directly from the National Association of Realtors. Um, this is the, uh, what, 25-year median home price history in a market that's very unique to a lot of other markets in the United States. San Antonio did not drop during the Re Great Recession, where many markets dropped from 10 as much as 60% in value in 2008, 9, and 10. San Antonio weathered the storm, and it's a very strong market economically. You can see there at the bottom, the most recent annual median home price is 337000 so pretty in line and, and actually lower than the U.S. average. <clears throat> so it's a good market. It's a safe market. This, this graph tells us a very safe, safe market to invest in. It's a market that's never seen a crash. It's a market that's very steady growth. It's a market that has, you know, very, um, you know, median home price properties. It's a very large market. So it's definitely one of our strongest markets. I like to share an example of a multi-unit. This is a duplex. It kind of looks like two homes squished together here. It's a unique duplex because it's a single-story duplex. We don't see those too often. Both sides are three bed, two bath. Both sides have a two car garage. Um, both sides have about 13 to 1400 square feet with a private backyard and a fence um, and a fence divider in between. These are multi-units that attract long-term renters. That's unique. Most apartments that have, you know, one to two units and maybe, you know, square footage of 500 to 1,000, we're not gonna see long-term renters. With a property like this, we get the benefit from the economies, economies of scale of a multi-unit. We get the benefit of the new construction, not having to worry about repairs and maintenance for so long. We also get the benefit from long-term renters. So um, this is a very popular type of asset that we sell and manage in the dozens and even in the hundreds. There's many different communities across Central Texas that this builder and other builders have very similar um, um, inventory. So this property is, is uh, 545000 for the duplex. That's for both sides. Um, we see them ranging anywhere from about five hundred to 550000 The um, average rents, or at least what we're seeing on um, rents for both sides, is we're seeing, uh, we are seeing uh, 1850, 1850 per side. So that's a 3700 total rent. And every property on our website, you can see a full detailed calculator. So uh, why is it says management zero? We offer one year free property management on these new construction duplexes. Our, our monthly income after principal interest tax insurance, HOA, <clears throat> all fixed expenses is gonna be maybe about 400 to $500 a month in positive cash flow. But we're really gonna see a lot of growth also in appreciation because these are A-class and even kind of on the, it says luxury class. These are really kind of like A class, luxury class types of types of uh, multi units. Renters love these properties. They're brand new. They also love them because they can either go out and, and rent a detached three bed, two bath for two thousand a month, or they can rent an attached three bed, two bath like this for eighteen fifty. So huge savings for the renter. Um, great investment for the uh, for the client. So I like to share that as an example. So we're in all types of markets, right? So Fort Myers is a market that's similar to, you know, Phoenix, Vegas, California, and many other markets that did see the, the ups and downs in the market. We see a lot of appreciation over time in this market, but I want to share with you another type of asset. Also a single, uh, a deta or excuse me, also a new construction duplex. Um, similar price range. We're looking at one for 535 here. 
Um, but just like the one in Texas, each side is a three bed, two bath. Uh, these both have about 1150, you know, about 1150 square feet per side. Also commanding long-term renters because they have the attached garage. They've got the three bedrooms. That's going to help us house a family that might stay in our property for five to 10 years. That's, you know, that's what we want. We want long-term renters. This, this is a different um, financial outcome. We're seeing about $900 a month in positive cash flow here. Again, this is after the, the seller concessions that go towards the rate buy down that get our rates down to about six to, you know, six and a quarter percent. Um, that's what allows us to get, you know, to lock in that interest rate. Um, we suggest about maybe 30%, 25, 30% down on most investment properties. It'll get you a lower interest rate if you're doing conventional. Um, that'll ensure more chance for positive cash flow. Um, because we're realtors, we can open up all the inventory in a particular market, resale, new construction, single family, multifamily, all over the area. We screen these properties, we go through them regularly, and then we put them on our website as good suggestions for example, investment properties. Um, it may be good for you, it may be good for a different investor, but you can shop dozens and dozens of property examples on our website. You can also use our filters to find exactly what you're looking for. Clarksville is also a very stable market. We have out maybe just a few more minutes here, but Clarksville is a very stable market and a very low price market. So, you know, I mentioned that it's our lowest price market. So for some newer investors, they're like, you know, how do I get in with the least amount of cash possible? You know, what, what, what's that barrier of entry? What are some of your lowest price markets? So we, we open up Clarksville because um, $250,000 is the median home price. That's, you know, most properties we're selling are around maybe 200, 250 to 300 or 250 to 350. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's a much lower price than most of the markets, but it's also a very stable market. It's a very strong market economically. Like San Antonio, no drop during the Great Recession, very stable, steady growth. And of course, in the last you know couple of years, um, with with the real estate market that we all went through in the last couple of years, it did see appreciation. But we're still priced at an average of about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per property. This is now a resale property because we do shop the MLS and we look online um, in all of our markets. So this is just a nice example. Built in 2000, four bed, three and a half bath, 2,200 square foot property, kind of on the higher range of size and square footage. Um, but, you know, it's a nice property that really fits our model. It's in a neighborhood that we already manage property in, which is, which is going to be the case for any property we suggest. You're going to see that it's already in a neighborhood that we already manage property that we're familiar with. With a 30% down, which is not the minimum, right? The minimum on a single family is 20 we're suggesting maybe 25 or 30 percent down. Um, this property, the rental analysis, 2100 a month, 349 sale price. After you know all taxes, insurance, HOA, there is no HOA here. Um, we're looking at about 130 dollars a month positive cash flow. There are just so many examples of properties on our website like this. I just like to share the ones that that we look at. Those estimates for maintenance and vacancy are kind of like phantom expenses. They're not expenses you're going to see every month. Um, it's, it's the only way we can look at it is really like on a monthly or annual basis. We, we factor that in without any rent increases. Um, so, you know, this is something that our advisors can explain more in detail is the dollars you're receiving every month on this property be 130. We're likely to see rent increases over time, but we just want to set aside those reserves for maintenance and vacancy um, for when they come up. So kind of finishing out the presentation, I appreciate you guys staying on a little bit, a little bit past time here. Um, we stick to major metropolitan markets because we have more population, more tenant base, more diversification of employers, which leads to more, you know, growth in property values over time. There's also a lot of competition in the property management. So that's a good thing for you guys. Why we're in the suburbs is because there's really one particular type of renter that we want. And, and the best quality renter that we want is going to be a family. Families tend to stay longer. Families tend to help us reduce our vacancy. Families are most likely going to be attracted to the three and the four bedroom um, types of properties. So for most of our properties, that, that's really what we're looking for. We don't like to significantly limit the tenant pool. So we stay away from like 
we don't do short-term housing. Um, we don't do like um, only student housing. You know, we're not trying to find like this niche. We want to open it up to the majority of the rental market. Um, we had a question there about um, the um, the annual lease renewal fee is a one-time fee, by the way. It's not a monthly fee. Um, the, per, the, the property management, whether you're at like six, seven, or eight, that is charged monthly based off of the rent only when it's occupied. That renewal fee is not charged on a monthly basis. It's a one-time fee. Um, some of our leases are 18 months. Um, we're, we're starting to negotiate 18-month leases now because we're in the winter, so we want that lease expiration date to expire in the summer. Um, I have a question here that this slide deck is actually available on our website. I can email it to you, um, Cameron, when you set up a call or email with Cameron. Um, Cameron can also send you the um, today's slide deck. So last couple slides here. You can download a market data packet on any of our markets on marshritic.com forward slash market data. There's tons of data and research on all of the locations we're in. Those are free economic guides that we want you guys to download and have copies of. If you're on our learn page, you're going to you're going to find our financial calculator. That's now a financial calculator that each one of you can use to analyze um, properties. There's tons of um, customization and a, and a lot of uh, a lot of features that you can use in our financial calculator. I mentioned Marsh Reddick, the one stop shop that brings all of these, um, you know, teams together. I only be able to kind of just comment on this for a minute, but these are some of like our, our key takeaways here. We like to help people build scalable portfolios. Um, we believe in only working with a company that will lease and manage the asset that they sell you. Proof is in the pudding. Um, we stick to properties that are self-sufficient. So meaning like the only time that you should be putting your money into the property is when you acquire it. And those, you know, that cash flow and that rental growth and those reserves should cover that maintenance and vacancy. Um, we help people build portfolios, and that might be over a two-year, three-year, five-year, 10-year period, but essentially the long-term goal is to be able to retire off of your portfolio, which should have diversification and not only in one um, metropolitan area. A couple of things down there at the bottom. We use this funny little um, you know, litmus test here. Would we feel comfortable walking our dog at night in that neighborhood if not maybe we shouldn't invest in that area. Um, that is just really based upon um, some of the key factors that would influence things like evictions or vacancies or property damages or appreciation in value. Um, so also we wanna make sure our leasing agents are comfortable showing these properties. So we're very particular. And, and you know, a lot of it's gonna be based off the crime rates in the school districts and um, just the desire of, of people wanting to live in a particular area. I think that this is, uh, you know, this is kind of the, um, the end of my presentation here, but I like to share ways that we decrease the risk in each category. Um, this is all part of the Marsh Riddick advisory process. We know that higher property classes have less vacancy, higher property classes have less maintenance. If we can put, you know, 20, 25, 30% down and ensure positive cash flow, Property values going up and down, as long as that we've got that rent covering the expenses, we can hold it long enough for that value to come back up again. We're very big on um, the types of insurance that we recommend, how much liability coverage, if you should have a loss of use clause. So I know I kind of covered a lot tonight, but this is exactly what you should look like when you buy an investment property with Marshall Reddick. This is what ultimately you should look like anytime that you invest in a property. This is what we want you to look like, not just right after buying it, but months and years after buying it. Um, this was uh, after my second um, closing in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, <laughs> I was just as happy then as I am now. I still own this property. It's appreciated quite a bit in value. The rents have gone up quite a lot. I've tapped into it already to do a cash out refinance. It's still positive cash flow. This is exactly the kinds of experiences that we want to create um, for each one of you. So, um, I recommend going on our learn page, marshreddick.com forward slash learn, looking at videos, articles, eBooks, calculators, all of it for free. We don't charge anything for the resources that we offer. And last and most importantly, to be able to schedule a call with Cameron Carlson, 
You can do that either by, you know, calling them, texting them, emailing them, or going on our consultation page on our website to fill out a consult form. Um, you'll be able to set up a call with Cameron, video or phone. And, um, you know, again, we can do as many conversations with you as you'd like. We love <clears throat> having that interaction. We love answering your questions. We love guiding each person in the right direction. And, uh, you know, we hope that you guys benefit from all these resources that I shared tonight. Um, I hope you get a chance to download some of these market data packets and eBooks and, you know, use our calculator and just benefit from all this free education. That's uh, really ultimately what we're here to do. So, Tony, I, I thank you. I thank um, all of you attendees for joining us. I, I appreciate you guys staying on a little bit longer here. I, I hope you guys got a lot from this presentation. It's hard to teach everything in a one hour or one and a half hour presentation. So I hope you have the opportunity to start using some of these um, web links and resources that we've offered you. And uh, thank you again, Tony, again, thank you so much. It's always fun. It's always a pleasure to uh, partner up with you. You as well, Scott. You as well. Great to see you, man. And good luck with everything with uh, with the new baby in January. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's uh, a lot to look forward to. So um, thank you. You know, thank you so much. And I'm very fortunate for the uh, my spouse and my my staff and my team and our partners and all of you. It's just uh, wouldn't be able to do it without, you know, without the people. So I hope that we have the chance to connect with all you further. And Tony, you know, same to you, man. I'm not, I'll be, uh, I might be uh, picking your brain a little bit. <laughs> on, uh, Let me know any questions that you have, man. Any, any questions that you have. Thank you. I appreciate it. So thank you folks. Uh, you know, happy holidays uh, coming up soon. And uh, we look forward to connecting with all of you further. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. And again, thank you so much, Tony and your organization. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.